Hello. I uh, wanted to welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about minimally invasive surgery, uh, general surgery, and general surgery considerations in pregnant patients. Uh, this is part of an ongoing SAGES resident webinar educational series. Um, for those of you who have not attended these before, they're hosted every couple months. They're a great opportunity to interact with uh, some faculty members to learn about some specific uh, topics in minimally invasive surgery and hopefully be a good learning learning experience for all of us. Um, we have a great faculty put together uh, for tonight who are going to be talking to you about some very common uh, topics in managing pregnant patients who present to us for care for general surgical problems, um, including David Alsbach, uh, uh, Siv Hintzmanian, and Sabrina Noria. Um, I'd like to just remind everybody we want to make this as interactive as possible uh, from the faculty to the participants and back and forth. We encourage everybody to use the chat pod, which is located in the left hand of the screen. If you have any questions that come up, things you want addressed or clarified, uh, issues and patients you've seen on your own, please feel free to forward those to us uh, during the presentation. After each presentation, we'll leave some time for questions and answers, but certainly don't save those until the very end. We'll try and uh, cover things uh, as they come up. Um, a couple housekeeping issues. If during the presentation you lose audio or uh, video connections, the best thing to do is just exit the webinar, close out of your browser, relaunch it, and log back in. If that continues, you may need to start your computer, but hopefully everything will run smoothly. Um, at the end, there's going to be a brief link. We'd ask you all to fill out a survey. Uh, the Resident Education Committee for SAGES uses the results of those surveys to de design future webinars and other educational efforts to really meet the needs of the residents. Um, and so if you have any, please forward them to us. We'd be happy to hear uh, suggestions for future topics. Uh, and lastly, the show is going to be recorded, and within the next two weeks, it'll be available on sages.org. So if there's things you want to refer back to, or if you have questions, or if you have to miss part of the presentation tonight, uh, you can certainly refer back. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first presenter is uh, Dr. David Alsbach. Dr. Alsbach is the Chief of Obstetric Anesthesia at North Shore University Health, um, and he's going to be speaking to us about anesthetic considerations in pregnancy and laparoscopy. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Dave for the last uh, four or five years as an attending and previously as a resident, and, and I really look forward to his presentation tonight and um, learning some things that, that are certainly very practical and helpful to know. So. Well, thank you very much, John. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm Dave Alsbach, the Director of OB Anesthetic at North Shore, as John said. Be talking to you tonight about the anesthetic considerations in pregnancy for laparoscopy. I appreciate being asked to participate in this uh, webinar. I think this is one of the clinical situations where we get into where many things uh, don't pass across the blue sheet between anesthesia and surgery for many different types of surgery. But this is one where it's important to drop that uh, drop that barrier between us. Uh, many things that you guys are doing on your side can affect uh, the patient and what we do and vice versa. So I appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you guys about our considerations for this problem and learn a little bit from you guys uh, listening to some of our other presenters. Get the business out of the way. I have no conflicts of interest related to this lecture to disclose. No associations with any products or uh, drugs uh, I may mention. So I'm sure you'll see this slide several times tonight or something similar. Surgery during pregnancy uh, is a relatively common phenomenon between 0.15 uh, oh, to 2% of all pregnant women will undergo some sort of non surgery during pregnancy. Uh, so it's not terribly uncommon. Uh, most common pregnancy-related are things we're talking about tonight, uh, acute abdominal processes like appendicitis and uh, cholecystitis, but there's also many other things. Um, I think John will be covering later, maternal trauma, surgery for malignancies, about anything you can think of uh, that patients who are not pregnant can go through, well, patients who are pregnant go through as well. So it's a... Uh, important in anesthesia um, to understand um, the difference in caring for the pregnant and the non-pregnant patient. Um, 
when caring for a pregnant patient undergoing non-obstetric uh, surgeries, our problem not only is the one patient, we have two patients now, one of which we don't have immediate direct access to. So not only do we have to have a thorough understanding of what's going on with the mom, not only from her disease process, but the physiologic and pharmacologic changes of pregnancy, we also have to understand what implications there are for the fetus. Uh, we have to avoid things that might be dangerous, drugs and techniques. We have to provide a continued, uh, ensure continued adequate placental perfusion and do our best to do things that can prevent uh, preterm labor. So I'm going to break down the talk into the two separate uh, patients, if you will, although there are many of them, as you'll see during my discussion, are uh, intimately linked. I'll try to do it system by system so we can kind of put it in a, in a, in a organizational in our minds. Uh, clearly, I'm not going to exhaustively go over all this. Uh, my, my goals are to try to give the surgeon uh, an overview and of some of our problems that we're associated with. So I'll go over the cardiovascular changes associated not only with pregnancy, but some of the things you guys ask us to do, like put patients in a supine position and inflate their uh, bellies with gas. We'll go over the respiratory changes, not only with pregnancy, but some of our problems with anesthesia, including rapid desaturation, and also and many things associated with the changes due to the uh, pneumoperitoneum. There are airway changes associated with pregnancy that make our job much more difficult, including difficult intubation, uh, bleeding in the airway, and gastrointestinal changes that uh, can increase a mother's risk of aspiration when uh, undergoing anesthesia, both on induction and emerging. And then we'll, I'll try to cover some of the fetal issues that we worry about when we're taking care of these, uh, these patients. The, primary concerns of insured fetal, fetal perfusion and placental blood flow as it relates to hypercarbia and hypocarbia, maternal hypoxia and maternal hypotension and how it relates to fetal perfusion. And then some of the things many people talk about, especially in the popular media, fetal drug exposure, both the risk of teratogenicity. No one wants to give a, a mom a drug that is going to cause uh, problems with the baby, both from a teratogenistic point of view and a, what's becoming much more in vogue to discuss neurodevelopmental changes, uh, behavioral and uh, learning disabilities later in life. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about the risk of miscarriage and preterm labor and what role, if any, there is for fetal monitoring during these procedures. So I'll do a brief overview of all that and happy to listen to any questions you may have. Well, maternal adaptations to pregnancy, uh, many different aspects of the physiologic changes in a pregnant woman during uh, her pregnancy. Many of the early changes are hormonally driven, but later changes are just associated with the physical presence of a large uh, uh, uterus and the fetus in the, in the abdominal cavity. Um, the, not only the physical changes in the rearrangement of the normal anatomy, but the uh, increased meta metabolic demands and some of the plumbing hookups, the low resistance to fennel circulation being most important. Uh, many of these changes to the mom are, you know, the reason your anesthesiologist may seem a little grumpy across the curtain there. We, uh, uh, this isn't our normal, um, normal case, and even though we, it's not uncommon to see this, uh, no one is completely thrilled, I would imagine, taking care of these patients, but it's a very important uh, important job. So we'll start with the cardiovascular changes. Uh, mom's cardio, uh, cardiac output, it begins increasing by about eight weeks and uh, maximizes by about the end of the second trimester. The uh, cardiac output is increased both by heart rate and increase in stroke volume. And the resulting uh, increase is about a 50% uh, increase in the cardiac output by the end of the second trimester. Despite this increase in cardiac output, the maternal blood pressure either stays the same or oftentimes goes down due to the development of a large, low-resistance uh, placental vascular bed. So it's not unusual to see moms with blood pressures in the 90s despite uh, cardiac output uh, near, nearly 50% higher. Um, one of the big problems we have uh, pumping all this blood um, 
to supply the baby and the growing fetus um, is aortal cable compression. You want to lay these patients down and someone wants to do surgery on them. So the aortic cable compression syndrome occurs when the gravid uterus most of the time compresses the IVC. Um, it also has compressed the abdominal aorta, although the aorta will put up a fight. It's a big, heavy vessel. The IVC is much easier to compress. The compression of the IVC impedes the venous return to the heart, which decreases this necessary increase in cardiac output. So mom's blood pressure, which is already borderline low, decreases dramatically in, uh, due to the decreased cardiac output passing through the low placental blood uh, resistance uh, bed and reduces the placental blood flow. The direct compression of the aorta may also further decrease uterine placental flow. This decreased placental uh, blood flow can result in fetal acidosis and uh, signs of fetal distress. So this is a very uh, challenging thing that, uh, you know, hard to operate uh, mom standing up. So we, we need to lay them down. So we typically, oh, wrong way, my, my phone. Um, we typically uh, lay them uh, left lateral. Uh, left uterine displacement uh, relieves aortic cable compression in part by uh, relieving the uh, obstruction to the venous return. Uh, these uh, authors here uh, studied how much left uterine displacement is needed, and uh, you can see from the graph, let's see if this works, get my pointer. I don't, have, don't seem to have my pointer, but as you can see from the graph at the right, the cardiac output at zero angles of tilt is uh, about six, and then by increasing it to 7.5 degrees, uh, no real change was seen, but at 15 degrees, they started to have some relief of the uh, uh, venous return obstruction, and uh, further increases didn't uh, seem to make much difference. Now, uh, I don't know if you ever turned the bed to 15 degrees, but that's quite a bit, and that may be clinically impractical from what you guys are trying to do surgically or just keeping the mom on the bed depending on her size. But uh, this is why oftentimes you say, hey, can we roll the bed to the right or can we lay her flat? You may get some pushback. There's also cardiac changes due to the pneumoperitoneum. Um, the carbon dioxide insufflation results in the decreased cardiac uh, output and index also due to impaired venous return. Combining this with oftentimes Trendelenburg position, general anesthesia, and uh, laying flat, perineal insufflation can decrease it by upwards of 50% as well. Some authors talk about limiting the insufflation pressures as low as you can go, but 12 to 15 is the recommendation, and that seems to limit the reduction in cardiac output, although if you're having trouble, you may be asked to lower the pressure further if you can. I know everybody likes to see real well and have a good working space, but uh, uh, if we're having trouble with cardiac output, that may be something you guys can do to help. In, the, in patients with limited cardiac reserve, people with uh, cardiomyopathies or uh, underlying uh, structural cardiac disease, there may have to be an alternative approach. Uh, an open procedure may be necessary. I don't know if that's sacrilege in this community to talk about here, but um, uh, they just may not tolerate the uh, insufflation and the uh, you know, insufficient data on pregnant patients to, to see if that's true. But we're seeing more and more uh, congenital heart disease or structural heart disease um, patients getting pregnant, so something to consider if they will not tolerate the pneumoperitoneum. There's also pulmonary change is associated uh, with pregnancy. Um, their minute ventilation increases by up to 50% when they're a term. It results in a chronic respiratory alkalosis. It drives their CO2 down to between 28 and 32 normally and runs a slightly alkalotic pH. This helps create a um, gradient for the baby to be able to offload their carbon dioxide and prevent uh, prevent uh, acidosis in the fetus. If the mom's CO2 is lower, it lets it run down. The baby's CO2 can run downhill a little better. Their oxygen consumption to feed the fetus in the placenta is also increased by up to 20 percent, although moms usually have the cardiac reserve to keep their PAO2 the same um, just by increased oxygen extraction. The thing that's most important to us as anesthesiologists is this uh, decrease in functional residual capacity by almost 20%. If you look at the graph here, the FRC, or functional residual capacity, is what you have left 
in your lungs at the end of a normal tidal volume breath, the expiratory reserve volume plus residual volume. Anesthesiologists think of this as like a scuba tank. It's our oxygen reserve. What we're doing when we're having them breathe that oxygen at the beginning of the case is denitrogenating this volume and saturating this with um, oxygen as best we can. Uh, that allows the patients to not desaturate when we make them apneic and trying to intubate them. Well, the decreased uh, oxygen reserves by the decreased FRC and the increase in oxygen consumption puts these pregnant patients at a greatly increased sort of hypoxia during periods of apnea. Average time to desaturation following induction is significantly reduced in the pregnant patients. And we seem to be at induction, if we seem to be busy and sort of preoccupied and not wanting to talk, it's because we want to get this tube in as fast as we can. Clearly, the goal of pre-oxygenation is to fill that FRC, whatever there is of it, with as high as uh, high of oxygen as we can. So look, the expired O2 to hover around 90%, nearly signaling we've gotten rid of all the nitrogen uh, in the FRC. The heads-up position may uh, aid in that. So some people, uh, prior to induction, kind of put the head up a little bit. Pneumoperitoneum does us no further favors uh, with uh, their uh, ventilatory uh, system. Uh, increases our peak airway pressure just by upward pressure on the diaphragm. This further decreases FRC. It also increases our VQ mismatching, resulting in shunt and dead space ventilation. Um, it also decreases pulmonary compliance, makes them fairly hard to um, ventilate. Now, this is a, a problem in any um, uh, any patient uh, who has a, a laparoscopic surgery, but it's just, it's especially difficult in um, in, in the pul in the patient who is uh, pregnant. This predisposes moms to hypercapnia and hypoxemia, which then means we got to uh, increase their ventilation. But the increased ventilation necessary to remove the excess CO2 uh, creates kind of a vicious circle that can further decrease our placental perfusion and decrease uh, venous return and, and make uh, the uh, fetal uh, acidosis worse. So our goal typically, um, we try to keep the CO2 between 32 and 34 if we can. Uh, we, uh, any increase in the maternal PaO2 limits the gradient for CO2 diffusion from the fetus, as I mentioned, and can cause a fetal acidosis. Best way you can help us with that is limited insufficient pressures, if possible, uh, to decrease the maternal CO2. This, uh, I have a typo here. Entitled CO2 correlates well with PaCO2. That means uh, the, uh, you don't have to necessarily do blood gases. There was some thought early that uh, moms may have a huge gradient between there, and so every pregnant patient needs an arterial blood gas sampling to verify that the entitled CO2 is actually showing with the CO2 for fetal, uh, fetal acidosis protection, but that has shown to be false. And maintain normal PaO2 levels uh, to uh, help uh, mom uh, with their increased uh, oxygen consumption. The airway changes we see, most um, deaths under general anesthetic during pregnancy were due to hypoxia, uh, often secondary to a failed or difficult intubation and the aspiration of gastric content. There are physiologic changes we deal with during pregnancy, including increased airway edema, weight gain, breast engorgement, venous engorgement of the airway that makes it securing their airway at the beginning of these cases difficult. The incidence of difficult intubation during the, in the pregnant population is as high as 1 out of 280, which is almost 8 to 10 times higher than we see in the general population. That's why if you ever go on the labor and delivery uh, unit, I'll, I mean, the, we do three to four general anesthetics a, a month and hundreds of spinals and, and uh, uh, epidurals trying to avoid having to put endotracheal tubes in these patients. But if we have to, uh, we have to. The, um, you see us look in people's mouths. We're scoring malentotic scores on them, uh, trying to predict their difficult intubation. Well, this tends to get worse the further along they are in pregnancy. By 38 weeks, the number of malentotic four, which is about the worst we see, uh, has increased by up to 34 percent. You can see on this graph here uh, the distribution difference between 12-week pregnant patients and 38-week pregnant patients. Now, this graph surprised me because there are so many, even at 12 weeks, malampati 3s, which is not terribly easy to innovate 
uh, patient, but the number of malin potty pores greatly increases. This most closely um, correlates with uh, weight gain during pregnancy. The, um, the relative risk of intubation does go up as malin potty score goes up. If you look at the chart below, malin potty four patients have a relative risk of difficult intubation and OB of about 11.3 compared to the malin potty one patients. Uh, this also makes mass ventilation somewhat difficult. Um, however, there's an interesting finding that just a change in malin potty score um, doesn't seem to fully explain why they are so much more difficult to intubate. So uh, oftentimes it's a selection bias, they think, may be going on. We know they're going to be tough to intubate, and we prove ourselves right by putting an endotracheal or putting a laryngoscope down them, and we see that it's going to be difficult. So we back out much quicker in a pregnant patient than perhaps we did in a non-pregnant patient. The management depends on whether it's urgent or emergent or the condition of the fetus or whether we predicted it. Clearly, we go through the steps. Uh, the difficult airway equipment in the last few years has helped tremendously in this, uh, this case, fiber optics, LMAs, and video laryngoscopy um, techniques clearly helped. We consider almost every one of these patients difficult, regardless of what their malignant score. And we try to choose regional anesthesia when we can. It doesn't much apply to this crowd here, but um, we definitely don't uh, don't try to uh, start at least till we ver verify we got the tube then. The gastrointestinal changes you guys are probably more familiar with, but uh, our big problem is aspiration uh, in all patients, but very high in the OB population. Circulating progesterone lowers the lower esophageal sphincter tone, and some of the anatomic changes just of the large uh, uterus shifts the uh, anatomy up and decreases gastric emptying and increases the incidence of gastric reflux. Almost all moms will tell you they have a little heartburn when they lay flat. Uh, gastric emptying is slower of solid to non-clear liquids, although clear liquids have seemed to be uh, um, shown to be normal. We aspiration prophylax all these patients, uh, at least in my hospital. We use a combination of drugs, but they're all assumed to have a full stomach regardless of NPO status. I've sucked out all sorts of stuff on people who didn't eat since you know, 6 o'clock the night before. Um, we uh, use H2 blockers like Pepsid. We use a non-particulate antacid like sodium bicitrate. Uh, and the pro-motility agents often used like Reglan. Uh, and oftentimes you see us doing rapid sequence induction with succinylcholine remaining the agent of choice for a uh, paralytics, and almost always secure the endo, uh, the airway with an endotracheal tube to prevent against aspiration. LMA can be used in very select uh, patients, but that's uh, you have to really consider that uh, before you just secure it with a good old-fashioned endotracheal tube. The fetal issues we see, uh, most related to perfusion, like we said, but there's drug exposure and preterm labor. Maternal hypercarbia directly causes acidosis. As we mentioned, if the CO2 is high, the CO2 transfers across the baby, um, directly related to maternal PCO2. Uh, animal models seem to show a decreased uterine artery blood flow when the mom is either hypo or hypercapnic, although that's not necessarily been shown to be true in, uh, in human. But uh, definitely the uh, severe acidosis is the problem. It can cause fetal myocardial depression and poor, mater or poor fetal outcomes. Um, maternal hypocapnia, hyperventilating too much can cause decreased uterine blood flow as well. So our goal is to uh, try to maintain that CO2 about uh, wh where we we'd like it between the um, 28, 30, 32 or so, um, and, and uh, try to keep the, uh, the baby's uh, acidosis uh, at bay. Oxygenation, well, in the NICU, you see them uh, very concerned about uh, too much oxygen and the risk of retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, mild periods of maternal hypoxemia for short durations is usually tolerated by the fetus. Prolonged maternal hypoxia uh, can cause placental vasoconstriction, further decreasing placental blood flow, again, leading to hypoxia, acidosis, and ultimately fetal death if it's not corrected. Uterine uh, intrauterine hyperoxia, however, not nearly as dangerous as previously thought. They treat in the NICU all the time, and they try to keep the stats down and don't give supplemental oxygen. But supplemental oxygen to mom doesn't seem to cause 
uh, change in placental vas resistance that doesn't seem to uh, ca cause problems for the baby, uh, either uh, blood flow or uh, hyperoxygenation doesn't seem to cause problems uh, later on. Hypotension is a, a real battle sometimes during pregnancy with the decreased cardiac output, supine position, and the pneumoperitoneum. Back when I was starting, uh, maternal hypotension was treated with ephedrine and long considered the first line of therapy. Phenylephrine was thought to cause placental vasoconstriction, especially in the pregnant sheep. Uh, the pregnant ewes were seen to uh, do this, although that's been later proven to, uh, subsequently proven to be false. And uh, phenylephrine seems to be the primary drug of choice now for maintaining blood pressure as long as the uh, heart rate seems to be adequate. Phenylephrine is superior in reduction of fetal acidosis at cesarean delivery under regional anesthetic, although it's unclear if this applies to general surgery cases or fetuses that are non-term. Uh, when we give drugs to mom, uh, we give drugs to baby. Uh, most anesthetics, if you study them, are known teratogens, and whatever, if you look at enough species, you'll find one, and in a high enough dose for a long enough time, it'll cause problems. However, most agents that we use are safe in the normal clinical circumstances. Potential teratogens people have talked about in anesthesia are nitrous oxide and benzos. Uh, nitrous oxide um, was given to rats 75% for 24 hours on J9 gestation. They had a fourfold increase in abortions and fetal anomalies. So that, uh, in the human model comparing rats, that's about, oh, an anesthetic for about three and a half weeks. Um, the mechanism of action seems to be related to B12. It causes uh, DNA uh, problems. The adverse effect of nitrous oxide in humans has never been dis uh, demonstrated. The largest retrospective study looked at 5,400 patients. 54 of them had general anesthetics compared to regional anesthetics, and 97% of those had nitrous in the study below. And uh, congenital malformations and stillbirth were not increased, although very low birth weight um, babies were seen. It's not clear if that's related to the uh, drugs we were given or the clinical situation at the time. Benzodiazepines like Versed and Valium are also uh, kind of uh, thought down upon. Um, early case controls were thought to be related to cleft lip and palate. Subsequent benzodiazepines have shown that uh, uh, not nearly as bad. Um, the uh, study um, conducted using them as anxiolytics during pregnancy, no evidence of teratogenicity, and uh, long-term follow-up seemed to be okay, no adverse effects on neurodevelopment. Uh, prolonged CNS depression can occur when used in the near delivery periods. We try to not use them in the labor and delivery suite, and withdrawal can take hours to months. Um, so again, in clinical, as long as you maintain mom's physiology seems to be okay. Neurodevelopment seems to be the hottest topic if you look in the literature. Um, they're, it's very difficult to determine seven years down the road the kid's having a little trouble in math and the anesthesiologist gave, gave mom Versed and it, it's causing problems in learning. Uh, recent studies have definitely implicated anesthesia with neuronal apoptosis in immature rodent brains and there's some studies coming online uh, in monkeys so uh, more developed primates seem to have this problem, although it's unclear you have to be careful being able to apply this to humans, uh, but it is raising concerns in our practice. Uh, this uh, Danish population study, it's the largest one they've done, and to follow along for 15 years is pretty impressive. Like that movie they got made where they made it over seven or eight years to do a study like this is pretty impressive. But um, they, they looked at kids who had surgery as uh, children or infants and then follow along and they did not seem to be able to determine a link between anesthesia exposure and subsequent neural development, but further research is clearly needed. Um, most studies do link a non-OB surgery during pregnancy with a reported increase in miscarriage and preterm labor. Many times it's hard to tell the difference between whether this is from you guys, us guys, or the underlying pathology but it seems to be independent of the operative intervention, be a laparoscopic or otherwise. Uh, tocolytic therapy, the obstetricians uh, are unclear on whether this, if uterine contractions, uterine contractions do develop after surgery, 
trochlitics may be initiated, it's important to get the obstetricians involved as close as these people are to term. I think I skipped one there. No. Decisions should be individualized based on the gestational age, planned surgery, maternal status. If the fetus is pre-viable, most obstetricians will tell you get heart tones before and after the procedure just to verify that the fetus is okay, but there's nothing really they can do. A viable fetus uh, at minimum needs this uh, and contraction monitoring to show that our surgery hasn't, our anesthesia hasn't induced uh, preterm labor. Um, but uh, whether or not you can physically do intraoperative fetal monitoring or should do intraoperative fetal monitoring needs to be discussed with the obstetrician. So it's fairly important if you're going to consider operating on a pregnant lady to get the obstetrician, her obstetrician if you can, if they're at the hospital or a covering obstetrician involved. Um, need to have a health care provider if they're close uh, or uh, close to term and viable, who can do a C-section, uh, and if the planned procedure you're doing will allow uh, stopping what you're doing to deliver the fetus if, if there's a fetal distress. Essentially, in summary, uh, I think we all feel that a pregnant woman should not be denied any indicated surgery, regardless of the trimester. I think most people feel the second trimester is probably best, but regardless, of surgery needs to be done. It should, should be done. If it's elective, clearly delayed uh, after delivery, uh, if possible, um, to remove, remove risk to the fetus. A uh, second trimester seems to be when preterm contractions and spontaneous abortion are least likely, and first trimester, things like neurodevelopment and uh, teratogenicity seem to be, if anything, a little less. This is a quote from a British study. Uh, Concerns have been raised about the human fetus for many years. That, that we can give. Uh, so nothing I can say is the best technique. And that's, uh, that concludes my part of the process. If, uh, we have a few minutes. I don't know, John, we can. Yeah. Dave, that was fantastic. Um, you know, uh, I, I like how you put in there things about neurodevelopment and maybe people coming after their anesthesiologist 10 years later. It just goes, first rule of surgery, always blame anesthesia. Yeah, um, when in doubt, blame <laughs> anesthesia. No, don't write that down. I don't mean that. No, in all seriousness, um, you know, let's say emergencies come up and they are what they are. For circumstances where you have a patient who – you know, has really bad debilitating gallbladder disease and they're going to need an operation during pregnancy, you know, is that someone who should be, who should meet with an anesthesiologist preoperatively? Is there other pre-op testing or things that are going to be relevant to preparing them for having uh, a general anesthetic during pregnancy? And there's so many changes you talked about. Yeah, what's, what's the best way to get them evaluated or get them tuned up as much as possible? Well, I think that's institutionally dependent. Uh, clearly, we're available for curbside at our institution, and if there's a pre-op clinic, the anesthesiologist may want to see them. I think for a routine, healthy, normal pregnant patient, most of them are young, most of them are healthy, most of them don't carry underlying disease. If their gallbladder is bad, but they're otherwise healthy, I don't think there's further testing per se that needs to be done, except perhaps based on gestational age, contacting their obstetrician and see what their plan of action is going to be. If we put this person to sleep and the baby doesn't do well, is this person 25 weeks or 28 weeks or 35 weeks that we're going to stop our gallbladder surgery, drop the obstetricians in there, get the baby out, then finish? Or is this an 18-weeker, we're going to check heart tones, going to do our best and, uh, you know, let things uh, fall as they may and, you know, uh, uh, check heart sure. tones before and after Sure. Uh, we've got a couple of questions come in about uh, end tidal CO2 and hemodynamic changes that occur with laparoscopy. Are those pressure dependent? I mean, if, if some of those operations can be done with CO2 pressures in the 7, 8, 9, 10 millimeter range, does that tend to minimize some of the cardiopulmonary I will, effects? I will never argue with you if you opt to lower the pressure, John. I mean, that's... <laughs> The CO2 as low as possible would be great. 
Um, we see hemodynamic changes with open procedures and at C-section. So insufflating the belly is not great for a pregnant lady, but uh, you know, uh, I'm sure our colleagues here in the next uh, few uh, presentations are going to tell how much better laparoscopic can be. Uh, so uh, you know, it is a um, it, 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 it's something we can live with if you can keep it as low as possible. Now you're working around, you're looking for appendix with a 25-week uterus in there. I think it's a little more difficult than looking for a non-pregnant appendix. So, sure. um, uh, you know, I think keep the pressure as low as you can, and I'll let you know what the CO2 is. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Dave. I really appreciate that. I think uh, we should get uh, moving on to our next presentation. Um, well, thank but you. certainly. Participants who have questions ongoing, please send them. Uh, University of Rhode Island is the chief of uh, minimally invasive surgery at uh, Brown. He's going to be talking to us about laparoscopic appendectomy in pregnancy, the workup and management. And if you think about uh, common problems that come up in pregnant patients, this is number one on everybody's list. Um, so uh, look forward to hearing from Siva. Hey, thank you, uh, Dr. Lynn. Uh, thank you, Sages, uh, for the opportunity uh, to speak on this uh, topic that most of us uh, general surgeons uh, are somewhat uncomfortable uh, dealing with, um, the issue of dealing with appendicitis in pregnancy. Uh, I want to thank uh, also Stephen Lamb uh, and Case Weston, who has helped us with the AV uh, end of things here tonight. Uh, as uh, Steve uh, Lynn said, I'm a, a general surgeon with uh, focus in uh, minimally invasive surgery, and um, I practice it, uh, in Rhode Island, uh, part of uh, the Brown University Surgical Faculty. I have a couple of disclosures. I have no disclosures as far as uh, conflict of interest. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that slide, but I also have a disclosure saying I'm not really an expert <laughs> in uh, pregnancy and laparoscopy uh, as maybe the others are in this uh, group of experts, but nevertheless, uh, I think uh, I have been given this task, and I hope uh, we can uh, uh, get some information out there for the residents who uh, would have to uh, deal with this uh, uh, somewhere in their training and also in their day-to-day -day practice in the future. So um, just an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we're going to go through introduction, how a patient may uh, comes to management of uh, a patient with appendicitis in pregnancy, and then we'll summarize, hopefully within the uh, allocated time. So moving on, uh, no talk is uh, uh, complete without the historic perspective uh, of that disease process. So uh, in that spirit, uh, you know, the first known uh, appendectomy in a pregnant woman was performed in 1848 by Henry Hancock, who was linked to a, a, a uh, Imperial Hospital in London, and um, he um, operated on this woman who had this right lower quadrant pain, um, and she was initially treated with opium, uh, and she failed that, and subsequently, because of worsening pain, he uh, operated on her, drained an abscess, and a few weeks later uh, found uh, two fecalates coming out of the wound. So this is the first documented successful appendectomy in pregnancy. Uh, so. Uh, surgical history is uh, somewhat interesting. If you think about it, a lot of things that we would um, shun upon, like opium and cocaine, uh, was used uh, widely, and this area is uh, no exception. Um, the um, diagnosis of appendicitis is a very important thing in uh, pregnancy. Why is that? It is a uh, the, uh, it caused about 25% of the surgical intervention in pregnancy. It is the uh, most common uh, non-obstructive emergency in pregnancy, uh, and most of these um, appendicitis uh, occurs during the second trimester. And if you look at the all three trimesters, the third trimester is probably more protective, 
as far as appendicitis. And there have been uh, some discussion about whether the state of pregnancy is uh, protective against pregnancy uh, or not. And the studies indicate that uh, sex hormone uh, increase or a state of pregnancy is probably uh, likely to protect the uh, woman from having uh, incidence of appendicitis. And this is especially true uh, for a woman who is uh, older than 35. So with that said, I want to uh, make sure the residents and the participants um, really pay attention to a couple of the sages guidelines that are out there. You know, our, mem our organization um, has many guidelines and position papers for many of the MIS procedures that we do, uh, ethical considerations and training or privileges, uh, how to get privileged in a particular procedure. So I would urge you to go to the website, SAGES website, uh, look at the SAGES guidelines, and if you look there, you'll also see there is a guideline on laparoscopy during pregnancy. So during my talk today, I'm going to hopefully um, highlight some of the uh, guidelines that SAGES have come out to help this practicing surgeon and the resident on managing certain controversial topics, uh, especially when it comes to laparoscopy and pregnancy. So, uh, so let's move on to uh, diagnosis. Now, this particular uh, statement by Edmund uh, Baylor uh, made in 1908, the mortality of appendicitis complicating pregnancy is the mortality of delay. This is one of the most important statements that you can hear, you know, a hundred years later, uh, I would say this is what you have to think about when you evaluate a patient. You cannot delay the diagnosis because the outcome is going to be poor. So an expedited, accurate diagnosis is important. So we're going to see how we're going to do that. So diagnosing appendicitis in pregnancy is no different from any other disease process. You go with the history and physical, the lab work, and then you go from radiologic evaluation and then move on to surgery. And then you know, sometimes a diagnosis is made uh, during patholo pathologic evaluation. So the clinical presentation for appendicitis in a pregnant woman is uh, the most common symptom is constant right lower quadrant pain. And uh, this is commonly seen in non-pregnant women. But this, if you were to uh, point one symptom that is uh, a complaint uh, that's most commonly seen is the right lower quadrant pain. Now, however, you know, having said that, the pain and late, or late peritonitis is masked often by this enlarging structure, which is the uterus in the pregnant woman, um, and the, uh, because of the enlarging uterus and the pushing of the organs, uh, the adjacent structures, the peritonitis or the pain could be diminished. So this is something that we need to think about while we are evaluating the patient. And nausea vomiting is the second most uh, common uh, symptom. It's about, about 50 to 55 percent of the patients would complain that. But as you know, most of our patients in the first trimester may already have nausea vomiting, and this may not help us uh, differentiate uh, appendicitis. However, if it is a new symptom, a new onset of nausea vomiting, uh, this could be quite helpful. The various abdominal complaints are seen in, uh, in uh, pregnant women, and they're often ignored or overlooked. So these patients may show up in your office somewhat late. Uh, and even when they show up, your vital signs cannot be uh, very uh, relied upon because often they have tachycardia at baseline. Uh, many of the, uh, almost every uh, uh, pregnant uh, patient, and uh, maybe even lo uh, run a low blood pressure. So uh, vitals are often uh, not reliable in uh, working up our patients. When it comes to a physical exam, again, the increase in uh, skin and muscle laxity it could uh, make some of the other uh, 
uh, helpful signs that we use for diagnosis of appendicitis rest look reliable, such as the Rossing sign and the obturator sign. And in late presentation, rigidity is not seen in the by half of the patient who should have rigidity. Uh, and almost all, never do you feel the uh, right lower quadrant mass. So the presentation could be quite tricky. Your examination could be unreliable. And, you know, interestingly, uh, because of the, uh, um, the uterus, uh, uh, uterus can be uh, pushing the organs uh, posteriorly and also superiorly, there will be displacement of your colon or the small intestine uh, during the uh, pregnancy. So this is something that you need to think about as you evaluate the patient. Now, this is a uh, diagram that um, illustrates how uh, in a normal patient, uh, you may be uh, looking at McBurney's point for, your, uh, for diagnosis of appendicitis. As time goes on, uh, you know, in a pregnant woman at eight months uh, pregnancy, your appendix could be near your um, subcostal region. So uh, you really have to think about uh, a change in position and location of the appendix uh, as the pregnancy uh, progresses. So, you know, so we've gone through the initial presentation, uh, the exam. Let's go on to lab work. Uh, the lab work, you know, the most common uh, lab work we would order is a CBC. Um, unfortunately, most of the uh, pregnant patients would have a high white count to begin with, and up to 20,000 uh, is uh, normal in the second or third trimester and is not a good sign of infection if you're going to rely upon that. Uh, also, CRP or ESR could also be high in pregnancy and cannot be relied upon. 20% um, uh, of the uh, patients uh, with appendicitis will see uh, have pyuria, uh, white cell count, uh, white cells in the urine, and this could be also seen in normal pregnancy. So, uh, you know, labs also are not real help, unfortunately. Um, so, we are, so when it comes to uh, a patient with right lower quadrant pain with a uh, tenderness, uh, long vomiting, uh, what is our differential diagnosis? And we, on your, in this slide, on the left column, we have your usual suspects that we would uh, have a differential diagnosis in our general surgery practice. Uh, but on the right side of the screen, the gynecologic uh, condition that maybe we are less familiar with is something that you need to focus on. I thought it would be nice to sort of uh, quickly run through some of the uh, actors uh, that are uh, non-general surgical uh, diagnosis. I think anyone who comes into the ER to your office with right lower quadrant pain and is pregnant, the first thing I would rule out is an ectopic pregnancy. So that is something that you should always rule out uh, at the beginning. The other diagnosis that uh, is often um, thought about, especially in early in pregnancy, is a round ligament syndrome. Uh, it causes mild right lower quadrant pain and is often uh, not associated with uh, nausea, vomiting, or other GI symptoms. And also, uh, this pain is somewhat uh, stable. It's not progressive, so that helps. Um, when it comes to pyelonephritis, uh, pregnant women have uh, more, more higher incidence of uh, pyelonephritis compared to non-pregnant women. Um, so it is uh, very common for uh, clinicians to treat pyelo um, for someone who has a fever, white count, and pyuria, and uh, therefore uh, miss uh, a diagnosis of appendicitis. And they may present late uh, uh, in appendicitis because they've been misdiagnosed and treated for pyelonephritis. So it's something for you to think about. Now, preeclampsia and HELP syndrome uh, also, it's associated with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, but uh, this di these diagnoses are entertained in the second half of pregnancy um, and uh, are often not um, associated with fever or leukocytosis. And, you know, as you know, the hypertension 
uh, is a, uh, usually present with this uh, condition. Now, the other thing, um, other diagnoses that you need to be aware of is a rupture of placenta or urine rupture uh, with low abdominal pain. Uh, what differentiates uh, here is the uh, vaginal bleeding and obvious uh, um, evidence of fetal distress in, uh, in fetal heart monitoring and urine tenderness. And uh, finally, uh, in postpartum patients, uh, the ovarian vein thrombophlebitis is something that you should be uh, considering when someone presents after delivering a baby with right lower quadrant pain. The, this can be as early as one week post-delivery. Uh, post uh, the symptoms uh, do include fever and abdominal pain, uh, but they are often um, uh, associated with mild uh, GI symptoms, such as nausea or ileus. And uh, again, this is something that you need to think about. <clears throat> so let's uh, move on to uh, imaging. Uh, imaging is somewhat uh, nowadays a standard uh, for many of our patients, even when they are not pregnant. Uh, unfortunately, most of the imaging that we rely upon has radiation. Now, radiation is a major concern for the developing fetus. Uh, in, in this case, uh, as we have pointed out, the history and physical may help, labs may not. So now we are um, in the area of imaging, and there's controversy. Uh, and the American College of Radiology uh, states that less than five rads exposure has no higher risk of fetal anomalies or fetal loss. So that's their stand. Now, what phages, uh, in the phages guideline, they have come up, uh, they actually have a little bit of a different tact. They've said that expeditious and accurate diagnosis should take precedence over concern for ionizing radiation. I thought that was a, a great statement here. I think making that diagnosis uh, and, make, and taking care of the patient should come first. Uh, again, going back to that um, statement I uh, quoted from 1908 early accurate diagnosis is important. Uh, accumulative radiation dosage in uh, SAGES uh, guidelines, again, uh, states should be limited to five to 10 rads during pregnancy, a moderate and strong recommendation. Now, as a surgical resident, you may be asked to go and talk to the patient about the uh, uh, recommended testing, and, uh, and often the patient may ask you, what are the risks, I think, you need to um, really, uh, while you talk about the risk of uh, the imaging, you need to also counsel the patient about the risk of normal pregnancy. I mean, it's important to know what the rate of spontaneous birth defects in normal pregnancy. It's 3%. And spontaneous abortion is could be as high as 15%. And prematurity or growth retardation, 4%, and mental retardation, 1%. So these are not small numbers. Uh, for even normal pregnancy. So, so when you talk about the risk, you need to uh, let the patient know that pregnancy itself has its own risk. Uh, so in the context of that, uh, doing the uh, testing uh, has to be taken into account. Uh, I, I thought this is a good uh, slide uh, to remember for us, for all of us. I think if you look at it, most of the tests that we order uh, are under two rads, including the abdominal series. Um, I'm trying to see the arrow to work. Uh, can't get it to work. But um, the abdominal CT uh, uh, is about three rads, and the pelvic CT about 2.2. So if you do an abdominal and uh, pelvic CT, the total uh, exposure could be uh, five uh, rads. So uh, my strategy would be to sort of figure out where the maximal pain is. If it's uh, upper abdomen, I would limit my evaluation to an abdominal CT with IV, without IV contrast. Uh, so this way, I do not um, give them the uh, higher radiation. Uh, that would be my practice. Now, just to uh, talk about you know uh, the fetal uh, damage or the uh, exposure and what it may cause, the first two weeks of uh, gestation, when you have radiation, 
the uh, the effect may be a mortality, um, and the second uh, through 25 CNS malformation and teratogenesis, and late in gestation, uh, this may lead to uh, uh, hematologic malignancies uh, later on in life. So uh, here's the uh, ultrasound uh, that is the most common modality that we use in pregnancy. The arrow shows the uh, appendix. Uh, uh, it could be done uh, abdominally or transvaginally. Well, the ad advantage of the ultrasound is there's no radiation. It's easy access. You can move the patient or move the uh, uh, technician to the patient. So the typical diagnosis is made when you have a, a more than six millimeter tubular non-compressible structure as uh, described in this uh, uh, ultrasound photograph. Um, and not only can you make that diagnosis, but you can also get other information. You can rule out gallbladder-related pain or GU-related complaints like pyelonephritis or uh, kidney stones. So it's important to uh, look at those other diagnoses while you're ruling out um, appendicitis. And I think also uh, using the ultrasound, you can establish viability and age of gestation of the baby. So, so the ultrasound has a multifaceted uh, uh, benefit uh, in using that in pregnancy. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the ultrasound is more sensitive in the first trimester, mostly because of the enlarging uterus. And the sensitivity is about 80%. And uh, SAGE's guideline number one uh, does say the ultrasound image is safe and useful. Uh, and uh, as we showed, uh, should be used as a, uh, probably the uh, first um, line of uh, diagnosis. Now, MRI uh, is um, now, com now used more and more uh, commonly. Um, the advantage of MRI is there's no radiation. Uh, it also does not uh, use the nephrotoxic uh, contrast material. Uh, there was some concern of heat production uh, and causing some injury in the first trimester baby that is uh, uh, that's been a theoretical concern, I believe. Uh, unfortunately, MRIs are not available and easily accessible in uh, every hospital. Uh, this probably is one of those studies that has the longest line in the hospital, and only certain centers do have it. So but there's an access problem with MRIs. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you don't have a, a, a slam dunk diagnosis with ultrasound, Waiting for that MRI, uh, you could uh, delay the diagnosis, and you, you should really not um, go that extra mile to get that MRI if it's going to delay care. Uh, MRI without gadolinium it would be the uh, uh, recommendation by SAGES. Um, and the uh, positive predictive value of MRI is pretty high, it's 97%. And the specificity and sensitivity is also pretty high, 92%. So it's important that you don't spend a lot of time, wasting time, trying to get that MRI. Um, in certain instances, uh, you may have to move on to get the uh, CAT scan. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, interestingly, uh, in this month's uh, uh, website in the American College of Radiology's uh, uh, release and uh, release a monthly release on guidance on MRI safe practices. It states that to quote, uh, present data have not conclusively documented any deleterious effects of MRI imaging on the developing fetus. Therefore, no special consideration is recommended for first or uh, any other trimester in pregnancy. So this is the the newest uh, recommendation uh, by American College of uh, Radiologists. Um, so um, they have been hesitant to sort of come up with this endorsement. Uh, the uh, SAGES uh, guideline number four does say MRI without a contrast can be performed at any stage, uh, and I think that should be pursued, especially when the ultrasound is negative. Now, FDA has still not come out and said is, uh, safety uh, for fetus is uh, definite, but uh, so far, 
all indicators are that MRI is uh, is here to stay for workup of uh, appendicitis in pregnancy. Uh, so MRI is positive when you have an appendix uh, um, of greater than six millimeters and periappendicitis inflammation as high as signal intensity. So uh, moving along, uh, a CAT scan again can be done in the, uh, uh, if need be but uh, certainly needs to be uh, limited uh, based on where the maximum pain is and limit to uh, two to four rads. Uh, so it's something that is in the armamentarium, probably not the best uh, out of the first uh, order of business. So when ultrasound is not useful in this uh, patient, when it's not detected carefully, the MRI is uh, brought in and it can show a uh, enlarged uh, appendix here. Uh, or here, uh, that makes the uh, diagnosis a little bit more conclusive. Um, and again, in another TT uh, image uh, showing a dilated appendicitis uh, uh, right here. So um, I'm going to skip some slides. Acute appendicitis again uh, in this uh, woman with appendicitis in pregnant women, you'll see a dilated appendix in MRI. Um, another view is shown here. So to summarize, I think uh, if you have a uh, workup of appendicitis, ultrasound positive, you do surgery. Uh, the uh, non-diagnostic uh, ultrasound, you move on to uh, uh, MRI if you have moderate high clinical suspicion or a CT. Low clinical suspicion, you observe. Uh, if you feel that the clinical suspicion is strong, you can go to the OR. So that would be my summary. Now, moving on to the um, surgery uh, component, uh, you know, obviously we are here to just talk about these surgical uh, indication and how we would uh, uh, move on to surgery. Before that, we want to talk about, you know, antibiotic use, their uh, safety profiles uh, during pregnancy. The commonly used antibiotics are mostly uh, safe, except uh, the uh, amyloglycoside uh, glyc and fluoroquinolones you should avoid, uh, and so is Bactrim and the uh, nitrofurantin. So these are things that I would avoid during pregnancy, and you'll see the top uh, meds uh, safe. Now, what is the role of non-operative management, antibiotic use only in uh, pregnancy and appendicitis? Uh, this uh, most recent study in, uh, presented in uh, surgical endoscopy in August shows in a uh, population-based analysis in Taiwan, uh, 859 patients, uh, 79 patients were managed non-operatively. They had about twice the normal uh, spontaneous abortion uh, rate uh, and probably not uh, a uh, standard approach. Um, and you'll notice, you know, delay and uh, rupture of appendicitis with uh, antibiotic ma management would lead to more complications to the fetus. So I don't think there's any role at this moment. As far as open visit laparoscopic approach for appendectomy, uh, first laparoscopic uh, surgery was done in a pregnant woman in 1987. Uh, until the last, de uh, de uh, last decade, it was mostly open surgery. The last 10 years, the open laparoscopic procedure has uh, gained traction and there's more safety information. Uh, in SAGE's guidelines, it's obvious that appendectomy can be performed laparoscopically in any trimester and is considered safe. Now, when you do a laparoscopic appendectomy, you can see the enlarging uterus here, uh, and you may not be able to put your normal trochas in the umbilicus, left lower quadrant, and suprapubic because you can injure your uterus. So this is something that you need to think about. Uh, so as uh, what I think about it is the trimester, and I try to figure out where the uterus is. The first trimester, you can still uh, put your port uh, in the uh, umbilicus, uh, right upper quadrant, maybe in the uh, mid-abdomen. As you go on to the second trimester, the trochars uh, have to move up. And in tri third trimester, they're sort of in a triangle in the right upper quadrant. So again, uh, these are things that you may have to decide based on where you uh, palpate the uterus. You may even have to use the uh, uh, ultrasound to help you. 
Uh, what is different from uh, pregnancy with a non-pregnant woman? Uh, they say trocar placement, concern for CO2, that we just talked about in the previous lecture. And general anesthesia itself can cause injury to the uh, developing fetus. So the areas of concern, as mentioned before, is premature labor, fetal loss, and long-term effects on the child. Well, why laparoscopic uh, appendectomy, again, is different from uh, in pregnancy is that uh, uh, laparoscopic appendectomy remains better uh, in, in the areas of wound infection, pain, and hospital discharges uh, in, uh, even in pregnancy. But however, the incidence of fetal demise is a little bit higher with lap api, and preterm labor could be as high as 26%. Now, this was um, a study, a, a, a um, meta-analysis uh, study that uh, three of them are out there. And the conclusion is in laparoscopic appendectomy, there's an increase, uh, slightly increased increase, uh, incidence of fetal loss, especially in the, uh, uh, in the uh, first study that I'm quoting. Uh, but if you look at majority of the studies, we'll say there's a slightly higher increase in uh, uh, preterm delivery. But the most recent study, uh, the Taiwanese study, showed that uh, in the last 10 years, uh, comparing open and laparoscopic approach, so they, there's no difference in preterm uh, delivery or abortion, uh, sorry, uh, abortion rate uh, in either laparoscopic or open ap approach. Steve, uh, Steve, I'm just going to uh, jump in for a second. Uh, this is uh, fantastic, and, you know, as you can see, when you take a look at the chat, you've generated about 20 comments about uh, patient evaluation, management, imaging testing, trocar placement, things like that. Um, I think we're going we're gonna to have you uh, jump over and try and answer some of these questions uh, for the participants electronically, uh, and we're going to uh, transition over and uh, move on to talking about biliary disease and pregnancy uh, just in the interest of time. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, our, our next talk is going to be and that's uh, gallbladder and other biliary disease. So thank you. Thanks, John. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And I'd also like to thank Sages. Um, what I'm going to focus on for about the next 20 minutes is the workup and management of surgically treatable biliary disease in the pregnant patient. And I have nothing to disclose. So just by way of background, uh, um, acute cholecystitis is the second most common non-obstetrical indication for surgery. And the pathophysiology that leads to gallstone formation is based on the changes in hormone levels. Estrogen will increase the cholesterol secretion, which causes supersaturation of bile with cholesterol, which makes it more lithogenic. Progesterone reduces bile acid secretion, which again supersaturates bile, making it more lithogenic, but also it inhibits uh, the gallbladder smooth muscle contraction, which leads to impaired motility and stasis. Now, in terms of the incidence of gallbladder disease, it's about 0.05 to 0.33% in the pregnant population. Interestingly, a study that was done by Cohen and his group demonstrated that ultrasound detection of new sludge or stones in women without evidence of, um, of any stones on their first ultrasound um, actually demonstrated 7.1% um, well, stones or sludge were actually demonstrated in 7.1% of women by the second trimester, 7.9% by the third trimester, and 10.2 by 46 weeks postpartum, which suggests that there is a tendency to gallstone formation, but in fact only 1 to 2 percent actually develop symptoms. And complications um, of gallstones developed in less than 10 percent of symptomatic patients, complications being things like cholecystitis, cholecystitis, lithiasis, pancreatitis, and gangrenous gallbladder. In terms of the presentation, um, it's similar to non-pregnant women. Uh, the, the, the presentation can be sort of uh, vaguely categorized um, into asymptomatic patients with gallstones on ultrasound, 
which is an incidental finding on the obstetrical ultrasound, which these patients frequently have or routinely have. Um, you can also have typical symptoms with or without gallstones on ultrasound, um, uh, divided into biliary colic and acute cholecystitis. As you all know, biliary colic, you have that recurrent right upper quadrant pain. It lasts one to three hours after eating, plus or minus actually being incited by fatty food. Um, and it can last one to two hours and slowly subside. Acute cholecystitis, on the other hand, is more severe. There's prolonged pain associated with nausea, vomiting, fever, anorexia, with involuntary guarding and a positive Murphy sign. And then you can also have atypical symptoms with gallstones. Atypical symptoms being things like chest pain, nonspecific abdominal pain, fluid regurgitation, abdominal distension, um, nausea and vomiting without biliary colic. But you have to note, especially in this uh, population, that patients with atypical symptoms with, without symptoms of biliary colic should be evaluated for other diagnoses, even if gallstones are demonstrated on imaging. The reason being that in this patient population, your differential diagnosis has to be split up into pregnancy and non-pregnancy related problems. In terms of pregnancy related problems, as we heard, um, there are things like preeclampsia uh, pre and health. Uh, the commonality between this and, um, and uh, gallbladder disease is that um, liver enzymes can be elevated. Uh, uh, pregnant patients can have acute fatty liver disease. Again, the common denominators being uh, symptoms of nausea, vomiting, epigastric pain, and elevated LFTs. Abruption and uterine rupture are, are probably easier to, to separate from gallbladder disease, certainly, but patients would present with abdominal pain. And of course, with intraamniotic infection, uh, patients will present with fever, leukocytosis, and abdominal pain, uh, which is similar to gallbladder disease. Obviously, um, there are other um, diagnostic criteria involved. For non-pregnancy related, you have to think of non-gallstone related biliary disease, uh, GERD, peptic ulcer disease, hepatitis, uh, right-sided pneumonia, and you have to think of appendicitis when it's later on in pregnancy because the appendix moves up in that area. So in terms of labs, remember uh, the normal range for pregnancy, your white count is going to be elevated, and your uh, ALP will be elevated, and the, the, the degree depends on the um, stage of pregnancy. In um, the first trimester, it's between 17 to 88. In the second trimester, it goes up to 126. And in the third trimester, up to 229. But certainly for uncomplicated gallstone disease, uh, your labs should be normal. Uh, complicated uh, gallstone disease, will demonstrate our patients will have an elevated white count, LFTs, amylase, lipase. Um, so it's recommended that for a patient, baseline tests to order include things like your, your LFTs and your billy. This will help you try to you know, help you figure out the complicated gallbladder disease versus health versus preeclampsia, amylase and lipase to rule out a pancreatitis, CBC for infection, health, or preeclampsia, and uh, urine protein for preeclampsia. So in terms of imaging, um, we had a great review in the previous, um, in the previous talk, so certainly I'll, I'll go through this briefly. Um, ultrasound ultimately is reliable and safe and what is recommended. Gallstones and sludge are visualized with a sensitivity and a specificity close to 100%. And acute or chronic cholecystitis can be diagnosed uh, with a sensitivity of 85 to 95% and a specificity of 95%. And remember, uh, acute cholecystitis on ultrasound also has that additional gallbladder distension, wall thickening, pericholecystic fluid, and the ultrasonographic Murphys. MRI, um, non-contrast MRI is a safe alternative to imaging during pregnancy if other non-ionizing forms of imaging are inadequate. HIDA scan is not a first line, certainly, for gallstone-related disease, but if needed, the fetal dose um, is less than 5 milligrays, and there has been no evidence based um, of increased risk of fetal anomalies, intellectual disability, growth restriction, or pregnancy at this dose. And in terms of CT scans, it's just not recommended for the evaluation of gallstone disease in pregnancy. Now, in terms of ERCP, um, it, this is usually what's used for patients that have, had, that have cholelithiasis or gallstone pancreatitis. Um, Post-ERCP pancreatitis in this population is about 5 to 16 percent, which is uh, similar to um, non-pregnant women. 
And evidence, of course, let me, let me qualify this by saying evidence for this is really based on individual reports. So um, what's culled together from this is that to decrease the risk of radiation to the fetus, you want to try to avoid fluoroscopy during the first trimester. You can consider other diagnostic tests, such as endoscopic ultrasound, which has the sensitivity of 88 to 97 percent, a specificity of 96 uh, to 100 percent for cholelithiasis. Definitely want to employ somebody who knows what they're doing, because the risk of pancreatitis is actually worse than the risk of radiation exposure for the fetus. Um, obviously, proper shielding, and you want to minimize um, procedure and fluoroscopy time. So in terms of management, general considerations uh, for any type of biliary disease is supportive care. Pain control, you can give opioids. Um, as you all know, we avoid the NSAID, because, especially after 32 weeks, because of risk of closure for the ductus arteriosus. Um, nutritional therapy as needed, IV fluid hydration, and antibiotics are recommended, but really only for patients with acute cholecystitis or cholangitis. It's suggested mon uh, that monotherapy with beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors, such as uh, Zosin, or third-generation cephalosporins plus flagyl or clinda if uh, the patient is penallergic. Again, it's recommended to avoid the fluoroquinolones and the carbapenems during pregnancy. So now what I want to do is go through specific types of gallbladder disease. Um, and their management. So starting off with biliary colic, first episode of biliary colic, as, it, as in with any pregnant patient, these patients are usually admitted. Um, uh, supportive care with dietary management is the first line. Uh, however, if the symptoms don't resolve, surgery should be offered. However, if the episode is in late third trimester or near term, then it's recommended that the patient be reevaluated after delivery and to plan the surgery six weeks after delivery. This allows the mother to heal after, after her delivery, as well as um, allow her to bond with uh, the baby. However, if there are repeat episodes of biliary colic, surgery is recommended in the second or early third trimester. And there is no role for ursodiol uh, for gallstone disease. Certainly in, in uh, pregnancy, it has been used um, in intrahepatic cholestasis, but its safety has not really been evaluated um, for um, gallbladder or gallstone disease. In terms of complicated gallstone disease, again, I start off with the basics, hospitalization and supportive care. But the treatment recommendations for this is really just based on evidence from, non uh, from the non-pregnant population. And um, I will be touching on acute cholecystitis, cholecystitis or cholangitis, and uh, acute um, pancreatitis. Before we get on to that, though, I just want to briefly talk about early intervention versus expectant manage, uh, management uh, for this problem. Um, and qualify this again by saying that all of this is observational da data. But what, what's out there is that early intervention is just as safe as and more effective than expectant or medical management. Surgical treatment is associated with lower complication rates. Pregnant women um, do have a longer adjusted length of stay but surgical intervention is not So pregnancy alone does not increase postoperative morbidity for cholecystectomies compared with non-pregnant women. So in terms of managing these, this more complicated gallstone disease, starting with acute cholecystitis, Surgical therapy is required during the initial hospitalization due to the high risk of recurrence or serious complications. Recurrence rates are about 55% with disease that occurs in the first or second trimester and 40% with disease in the third trimester. Uh, readmission rates of 38 to 70% occur with conservative treatment and there is increased severity with each relapse. And in fact, in one study, it showed that 27% of relapses did require surgery. However, there was not an increased risk of fetal or maternal morbidity or, mort or mortality. Near, nearer to term, conservative management should be tried first, more so because of surgical difficulties at that time. So ideally, you want to treat these patients with uh, IV, anti um, IV fluids and antibiotics. If they respond, you delay surgery until after until six weeks after delivery. But if they don't respond, you have to bite the bullet and you have to do surgery. So in terms of complicated gallstone disease and cholecystitis, 
It's recommended that you have prompt intervention using ERC ERCP with sphincterotomy followed by cholecystectomy. There are actually no trials out there comparing ERCP with interval cholecystectomy versus a lap coli and CBD exploration. So I really can't comment on that. But if ERCP is not successful, uh, then certainly a cholecystectomy with uh, intraoperative uh, cholangiography or ultrasound followed by a laparoscopic or open common bile duct exploration is recommended. Now, if a patient has cholangitis, obviously prompt ERCP if possible, but if it's unavailable or it's not successful, then you have to consider percutaneous or open biliary tract decompression, especially if the patient is high risk. Now, finally, in terms of acute pancreatitis, gallstone disease is the most common cause of acute pancreatitis during pregnancy. Um, a uh, systematic review of 112 patients uh, did demonstrate, well, first of all, most patients do improve with supportive care, but this review demonstrated that there was no difference in uh, maternal mortality for conservative versus surgical management, but fetal mortality trended higher with conservative management. Um, especially in patients who don't improve quickly. So certainly it's, it's, uh, it's recommended that after resolution of symptoms of, uh, of pancreatitis, uh, cholecystectomy is indicated for patients, usually during the same hospitalization to prevent a recurrence. Patients who don't respond promptly should undergo intervention with ERCP and sphincterotomy or biliary stent placement or cholecystectomy, especially given the higher trend to fetal, morta uh, fetal mortality. So now when talking about surgery, um, as has been described before, you need to consider uterine size, maternal body habitus, past surgical history, surgeon experience, and availability of appropriate staff and equipment. is the need for, to move the uterus away from the operative field, a, a recovery is earlier, postoperative pain is reduced, um, opioid usage is reduced, you make smaller incisions, there's fewer wound complications, it's overall better, uh, better patient recovery. But if, laparoscopic, if laparoscopy cannot be safely or effectively completed, then conversion to open is absolutely appropriate. Uh, modifications to basic laparoscopy include the fact that the patient should be placed slightly head up, tilted to the left to allow the uterus to fall away from the cava, rotating the bed up, uh, to, uh, sorry, rotating the bed to the left side 30 degrees with chest and thigh restraining straps improves visual visualization, especially in the third trimester. Um, the open Hassan technique is um, generally recommended to gain initial access into the abdomen. The primary port, the supraumbilical trochar, should be placed at least six centimeters above the uterine fundus. And as gestational age increases, a subxiphoid or left upper quadrant or right upper quadrant insertion will uh, help avoid the enlarged uterus. So this is uh, taken actually from um, uh, a great up-to-date review, which is referenced there in number three, and you can see here uh, where the initial port placement six centimeters above the midline. Um, or possibly in the left uh, midclavicular line in the subcostal region um, to access the abdomen. Um, additionally, intraabdominal pressure should be maintained between 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury and not exceed 15, as, uh, and we heard the reasons why in, in that great first talk. Um, the technique of laparoscopic cholecystectomy is similar uh, to non-pregnant, uh, sorry, the technique in pregnant patients is similar to that of non-pregnant patients. Um, if you need intraoperative cholangiogram, the radiation exposure to the fetus is not significant if shielded by a lead apron. Um, you want to maintain that end tidal CO2 between 32 to 34, and um, as mentioned earlier, um, capnography can be used and, is, and is, as is effective in use. And because it's laparoscopy and you inflate the belly, certainly fetal heart rate should be confirmed and documented before and after the pre after the procedure. You really can't do it during the procedure. In terms of post-op care, um, a fetal heart rate should, and uterine activity should be monitored. Opioids and antiemetics can be used to control post-operative pain, and of course you can defer to the obstetrician. Um, again, NSAID should not be uh, used. 
Uh, you can advance their diet, clear fluids to a uh, diet is tolerated. And certainly, uh, depending on the st uh, clinical stability of the patient, they can go home the day, the day of or the next day after surgery. So in summary, gallstones are common during pregnancy, but less than 10% of symptomatic patients with stones or sludge actually um, uh, develop symptoms that require surgery. The clinical presentation is not significantly different than that of non-pregnant patients. The criteria for di the diagnosis is, is the same as the non uh, non-pregnant population. Um, ultrasound is reliable and safe, although common bile duct stones are not as well identified. Um, other imaging that can be considered in these cases include MRI, um, HIDA, and um, uh, cholangiography. Lab studies can be helpful, um, as in uh, non-pregnant patients. If it's uncomplicated biliary colic, the labs are usually normal, but the labs will change if, if, um, if the disease becomes more complicated uh, to help you differentiate between um, gallbladder versus non-gallbladder um, etiologies. Um, regardless of how they present, pregnancy-related related conditions must be considered even if gallstones are pre present on ultrasound. Initial management in all cases is supportive, including pain control, IV fluids, and antibiotic uh, therapy. And uh, cholecystectomy can be performed safely and effectively during any trimester of pregnancy. Uh, a first episode of biliary colic should be treated with supportive care, but if it's recurrent, surgery is recommended. Uh, for acute cholecystitis, surgery is recommended during the initial hospitalization due to um, relapse rates. But again, if the patient is near term, you try to uh, um, avoid surgery until six weeks postpartum. Uh, Sabrina, that was fantastic. Um, you know, several questions came through talking. Uh, a couple, what about the role for percutaneous cholecystostomy tube placement for acute cholecystitis? So gallbladder drain placement, is that appropriate? Is there a role for that in any of these patients? Yes, certainly, again, from a lot of these observational um, studies, if the patient is very sick uh, and they've got cholecystitis, not a, not a cholangitic picture, but cholecystitis, and um, they're just not a good surgical candidate at that point, absolutely a cholecystostomy tube um, can be done to decompress. Sure. Sure, and, you know, and a couple of questions came through about this about, you know, I, I can recall seeing patients being with severe recurrent biliary colic being treated with, you know, narcotics and put on TPN because they couldn't eat very well. I remember seeing that when I was a student and a resident. Mm -hmm. Is that is that appropriate? If, those, if someone has recurrent biliary colic in the second trimester, third trimester, should they be treated with surgery up front? So yes, for recurrent biliary colic, um, in usually for definitely for second or early third trimester, um, um, surgery is recommended. You really there's no there's no um, added value in trying to put these patients down with just TPN and pain medication. But if this occurs in the late third trimester, if possible, the patient should try. You should try to manage the patient conservatively. But if, if they don't recover and if they don't respond to conservative management, you take them to the OR. Sure. Okay. Great. Um, so there's a there's a list of questions. Certainly, Sabrina, if you're able to jump over there and answer some of the ones. And participants, please feel free to type in your own questions. You know, certainly some of the presenters have shared those. but. other surgical considerations in pregnant patients. And um, this, can, this encompasses some surgical diseases. It can also encompasses some pregnant patients who have undergone prior operations, such as uh, weight loss surgery. You know, it's the stages we have to try and focus on some of the minimally invasive things as well. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, pregnancy and patients who've had uh, weight loss operations. So uh, these are my disclosures closures, none of which are going to be relevant to what I'm talking about. So we'll talk about some of the special considerations and scenarios. We'll go over a little bit more about perioperative fetal monitoring, talk about hernia disease in pregnancy, uh, talk a little bit about management of uh, 
pregnant patients who suffer a, a trauma, um, and then uh, touch touch on some issues regarding uh, weight loss surgery and a couple other rare uh, events that can be life threatening during pregnancy. So fetal monitoring, this is again from the SAGES guidelines, uh, non-invasive uh, fetal monitoring basically it's just fetal heart tones, um, and then for uh, uh, fetuses that have reached viability, in addition to measuring a baby's heart tones, you can also do tachography, which is the two big bands that put across a woman's belly and they correlate uh, uh, fetal heart rates with um, uterine contraction activity. Um, you know, there's a lot written about doing this intraoperatively, and, and I can recall some patients having intraoperative fetal monitoring, which, you know, there's like 20 people in the room, and every, everyone's trying to take care of the patient, anesthesia's got extra people, the surgeons are there, there's an OB person, and then there's some poor OB resident stuck trying to measure fetal heart tones crouched between the legs of a patient lying supine. So fortunately, we tend to get, get away from that. Um, it's probably more useful to do just preoperative and post-op uh, fetal monitoring. It can really be done in any stage of pregnancy, but again, the greatest utility for, uh, for this is going to be once the baby's reached an uh, age of viability. Um, certainly, uh, documenting pre- and post-op is very important, but from the standpoint of potential intervention, how you might modify what you're doing, it's obviously going to be most beneficial once you reach viability. So pre-viable, just pre- and post-op do Dopplers, viable is going to be a uh, Tachography with fetal heart tone monitoring, and then there can be a role for some of that intraoperative monitoring. So, if you have an operation that has a very high risk of causing preterm labor, and probably the one who we talk about most commonly would be a really bad ruptured appendicitis that's got pus throughout the abdomen, particularly uh, in a woman who's in the late stages of the third trimester. That may be a scenario where that patient actually does go into labor in the operating room. And that's also an operation that can be interrupted if necessary. So if there's an intervention like an emergency C-section that can be performed while you're in the operating room, I think most of us would agree that stopping an appendectomy for that is probably appropriate. If you're talking about a patient who's at a a gunshot wound to their vena cava, that's going to be a different scenario. You can't really, can't really stop fixing that um, at any point. So I think intraoperative monitoring may have a role, particularly for patients with uh, who are close to term and uh, those where their operation has a pretty good chance of putting them into preterm labor. Talking about hernias, uh, hernias are very common during pregnancy. This is I mean, this is a Google image, but uh, could be a picture of any number of uh, female patients who see us for hernia disease, uh, both during and after pregnancy. Umbilical hernias are the ones we certainly see the most commonly. You can develop groin hernias during pregnancy. It's less common and fortunately less likely to present as an emergency problem. But by all means, we should really try and avoid repairing these during pregnancy. Um, if it's a dire emergency, then they should be fixed, obviously. But when you think about the things that are going to impact your ability to do a good hernia repair, conditions where you have increased intra-abdominal pressure are going to uh, lead towards uh, lead to recurrence. That's probably the biggest modifiable factor um, other than smoking is the amount of intra-abdominal pressure a patient has around the time of a hernia repair. And pregnancy is the best example of uh, temporary increased abdominal pressure that will get better. So if you can avoid fixing it until after surgery, it certainly makes sense. There's not a lot of data about umbilical hernia repairs in pregnancy. There's a great talk at Sages about this two years ago. Um, but, you know, when to do these operations I think is a little tricky. And so you, when you think of them in terms of clinical scenarios, if you have a young woman who's got one child and has a relatively asymptomatic umbilical hernia, to me the key question for that patient is are they planning to have more children or not? If that patient is pretty sure they don't want to have more children, so they're not going to go through another pregnancy, increased pressure, and increased likelihood of a recurrence, it may be appropriate to repair them. On the other hand, if they're planning to have more children, then I think if the symptoms are minimal, they should be delayed until after pregnancy is done with. Um, if you have, on the other hand, if you have a patient who knows for sure they're not planning to have any more children, they're treated just the same as any other uh, non-pregnant or non-peripartum uh, patient. You would fix them whenever it's appropriate. Um, the tricky scenario is if you have a woman who's had one child and is definitely planning to have more children who has a very symptomatic hernia um, that you know rates pretty significant abdominal pain. They're tender when you try and reduce them. 
that patient I have a very different conversation with. I tell them that they probably should have an operation to avoid or try and reduce the chance of an emergency problem while they're pregnant. Um, you do that with the knowledge that their risk of recurrence is probably going to be higher. Uh, patients have a tendency to ask about whether or not mesh is appropriate in those cases. I'm not aware of anything that says um, the presence of mesh interferes with your ability to do a C-section if it was necessary, particularly for an umbilical hernia. Um, but that's a conversation that uh, patients will want to have if they present to you in this manner. Umbilical hernias in non-pregnant patients, again, management should be based on their symptoms. If their symptoms are minimal, fix them when they're done having kids. On the other hand, if their symptoms are more significant, it probably makes sense to repair those prior to any future pregnancies. Um, this is a case report, a really unfortunate woman who actually had an umbilical hernia rupture. Um, so she had a, a hernia where her skin necrosis, and that's uh, bowel with Crohn's disease, kind of in the right lower quadrant. That's a horrible picture. Certainly uh, hope none of you ever encounter this scenario, but that's what we're trying to avoid. So if you have patients with very symptomatic hernias, it probably makes sense to repair those prior to a future pregnancy with the explanation of the patient that their risk of recurrence is going to be higher and they may be back to getting this fixed again. Your goal in that patient is to avoid an emergency problem during pregnancy. Inguinal and femoral hernias are not likely to present, particularly in, the, in a patient's first pregnancy. Patients who have been pregnant multiple times, multiparous or multiparous, they're more likely to develop groin hernias that may re relate to some stretching and attenuation of the round ligaments. So if patients have small hernias, things uh, they, can, uh, they can telescope in and out of a hernia defect. Fortunately, from a groin hernia standpoint, if you look at this sagittal section of a pregnant patient, you know, right around here, that's probably where an inguinal hernia is. And as the uterine fundus grows up, all of the bowel and everything gets pushed up here. So the chance of having a piece of bowel slip down this way and pass into a groin hernia is going to become less and less as pregnancy moves on. So you may see patients with, uh, with inguinal hernias during pregnancy. They may have some mild symptoms. You can probably reassure them that their chance of, uh, in, uh, of an emergency problem related to that is going to be fairly low. So uh, while these can present, probably do not require treatment during pregnancy. Diaphragm hernias, you know, I never knew how, di how diaphragm hernias were common in pregnant patients until I assigned myself this uh, presentation. Just to review, boctolic hernias, congenital hernias that occur along the posterior portion of the diaphragm, most commonly on the left, they can occur on the right. These encompass the majority of congenital diaphragmatic hernias. More gagney hernias, those tend to be the parasternal or retrosternal hernias. Those are less common than boctolic hernias. And the last type, uh, post-traumatic hernias, this can occur after any uh, blunt trauma, such as a, a car accident or a penetrating trauma to the thoracobdominal region. <clears throat> Most diaphragm hernias, and again, we're not talking about hiatal hernia disease, um, most diaphragm hernias are small and relatively asymptomatic until you have an inciting factor. So uh, pregnancy, if you, if you look at the number of patients who have hyperemesis during the first trimester, it's a significant number of people, and hyperemesis is a constant valsalva putting pressure on your chest. And unlike a hiatal hernia where there's an esophagus and a stomach to prevent other uh, abdominal organs from passing into it, uh, congenital hernias don't tend to have those. Uh, as pregnancy moves on with the increases in intra-abdominal pressure and up you know, asymptomatic diaphragm hernias, most common time for those who's in their third trimester pregnancy, almost every one of them has experienced that to some extent um, during their pregnancy. So on the right-hand corner, these are some image, images of patients with diaphragm hernias. Here's a boxelic hernia with a stomach herniated through it. This is a chest film showing an, uh, a gastric bubble in the left chest. This is different than a hiatal or peristophageal hernia where you'd see a gastric bubble in the mediastinum. Um, and fortunately, these can be diagnosed particularly just with x-ray alone. Uh, this is just a, a supine x-ray. Uh, fetal maternal mortality of these can be very, very high. The management of them depends on their symptoms. 
Um, if they need to be repaired, hopefully none of you ever encounter this, but if they need to be repaired, uh, it should be timed in the second trimester for the reasons described already. Laparoscopic repairs are really ideal for these because you can position patients in kind of that um, uh, upright position rather than supine. You can elevate the side of the table so that the, the right side is up. Thoracoscopic approaches for right-sided hernias may be appropriate for left-sided hernias. It's probably not because that requires patients going in a right lateral decubitus position, which puts the uterus directly on top of the vena cava and further exacerbating those uh, physiologic changes that uh, Dave Alsbach talked about earlier. Change gears a little bit, talk about some different scenarios, trauma, you know, trauma affects pregnant and non-pregnant women alike. Um, there's a great uh, trauma surgeon I worked with, a medical student who always said, can't save a, save a baby in a pregnant scenario if you can't save their mother. Trauma in pregnancy affects 7% uh, of all pregnant women, as you would, as you would expect. The majority of these are blunt trauma, either uh, motor vehicle crashes, falls, assaults, <clears throat> and the risk of maternal mortality is pretty significant owing a lot to those physiologic changes. In a major abdominal trauma, there's a fetal mortality rate of up to 60%. The main mechanism of that is placental abruption, so it's different than what we talk about with fetal mortality during surgery. It's not preterm labor. It's an abruption where you get bleeding uh, between the placenta and, and the uterus, causes uh, ischemia to the baby, sometimes can present without vaginal bleeding if it's a contained abruption. Um, there's no level one data available about how to manage these patients. Most of it comes from level two and three data, and that's probably what we're going to have to live with collected from these types of studies. If you look at predictors of bad outcomes for a baby, typical things we use on the maternal side, injury severity score, glass comb scale, pH of presentation, presence of hypotension relative to where they are, acidosis, um, those are all predictors of bad outcome for a fetus. Certainly on the fetal side, vaginal bleeding, uh, uterine tenderness, uh, contraction signifying preterm labor, low fetal heart rates, or other types of abnormal monitoring. There's very conflicting data about how to resuscitate these patients, <clears throat> how much and what type of fluid should they be given, early blood transfusions are avoided, use of adjuncts like factor seven, what are the indications for emergency C-sections, really challenging scenarios, how do you manage pelvic fractures, and certainly if you're dealing with uh, penetrating abdominal trauma <clears throat> in a woman who's in her third trimester of pregnancy, that can be very, very challenging. Fetal field monitoring, again, is useful after 20 weeks of gestation in particular. All patients who have any type of abdominal trauma should have 6 to 12 hours of monitoring afterwards. For any signs, fetal distress, patients with vaginal bleeding, uterine contractions, obviously those, are, those patients are going to have more monitoring. Management principles, again, if you correct the problems that the mother has, most of the time that will correct the problems with the fetus with, with the exception of an abruption. Uh, resuscitate the mother, put her in that left lateral decubitus position. If you're doing x-ray evaluation, shield the fetus. This is a nice reference. This is about how much radiation you get per test. So the ones I care about, CT scan of the abdomen, two and a half rads. We want to keep it less than five, uh, absolutely less than ten. So you may say, boy, this patient needs pelvis x-rays, uh, extremity x-rays, that sort of thing. Rather than doing all those x-rays, let's just do a CT abdomen and pelvis. That's going to encompass most of it. And obviously, for all of these conditions, I see some comments going through those about there. Um, uh, you should be involving an obstetrician uh, early, if possible. If you don't have one available, you should find one. And if the patient can't get to one of your institution and is stable enough, they should go to an institution with obstetrics. Emergency C-sections and trauma are really based on a combined risk as assessment. Emergency C-sections can be performed if they don't if they don't raise the risks or raise the stakes for the mother. Perimortem C-sections can be performed after maternal death. That's certainly a scenario no one wants to discuss, but typically that's a very time-dependent phenomenon. If if a mother passes away as a result of trauma, uh, the clock is ticking. So within a few minutes, uh, fetal morbidity and mortality is going to go up dramatically. So it's a very time-dependent uh, phenomenon. Shifting gears again, we're going to talk about bariatric surgery. Certainly, bariatric surgery emergencies is kind of like a buzzword uh, in phages and in minimally invasive surgery that, that surgery problems that bariatric 
patients come up with or present with should be handled as if they didn't have bariatric surgery. You should take care of them just the same. And it's a little trickier when you talk about a patient who has had weight loss surgery, who's had bariatric surgery, and becomes pregnant. Certainly, we're not going to do a gastric bypass on a woman who's you know in her first trimester. That's ludicrous. But you will see a patient who's had a gastric bypass who now is in her first trimester, and those are some special issues that come up. Bariatric emergencies tend to focus on gallbladder disease since uh, biliary disease is much more common in the bariatric population. Small bowel obstructions can be common, particularly from the internal hernias that we see. So just to review, this is the anatomy of a retrocolic Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. This is the mesocolic defect here. This is the retro uh, defect, otherwise known as Peterson space. And down here, C is the, the typical jejunogejunostomy mesenteric defect. Internal hernias can present at any of those locations. Their present, presentation can be insidious, can be as subtle as just some vague abdominal pain or vomiting. Again, very common problems in pregnant patients. Um, I often am asked to see people who've had weight loss surgery who are admitted with abdominal pain during pregnancy. Those are patients I see myself. Certainly my residents see them, but I make it a point that myself or one of, one of my partners who has experience in, in bariatric surgery sees that patient relatively soon. Because the presentation of those things can be very subtle until it's too late, the imaging tests we use, contrast studies, uh, CT scans, diagnostic laparoscopies may not be as readily available or easily obtained in pregnant patients. If you're talking about pregnancy post bariatric surgery, uh, fortunately it's a very common thing. So you look at patients who have PCOS or other infertility disorders, bariatric surgery improves uh, fertility outcomes after those. If patients have had a weight loss operation, they are more likely to become pregnant, not just from the medical, but often from a lot of the social reasons. Um, and weight loss surgery will decrease their risk of gestational diabetes, macrosomia, uh, hypertensive disorders such as eclampsia and preeclampsia around the time of uh, delivery. At the same time, that does increase the risk of intrauterine growth restriction or low birth weight infants, and so it's a balance. So you're going to decrease a lot of the potential maternal complications that can happen with pregnancy. On the other hand, you can increase the risk uh, to, uh, to the baby, and, and I think the biggest thing is prevention. So gastric bypass, duodenal switch patients, they're all at risk for chronic anemia, vitamin B1, B6, B12, folate, iron, vitamin D, calcium deficiencies, you name it, they're at risk for it. And, and those we tend to follow with annual labs in, in patients who have had any weight loss operation. Protein calorie malnutrition is probably the biggest challenge uh, for a pregnant patient who certainly has increased caloric uh, demands to support her and her baby. The greatest risk of protein malnutrition with weight loss surgery is during the rapid weight loss phase, uh, which is typically the first year after gastric bypass, sleep gastric me and do a deal switch. So we tend to avoid, uh, we, we recommend that our patients avoid becoming pregnant for at least a year and maybe even two years after surgery. So pregnancy during that rapid weight loss period can be very, very challenging to handle with a malabsorptive operation. Um, and even in that first, you know, that 12 to 18 month range where patients are kind of settling into their new life once the rapid weight loss is over, pregnancy can be a major stress and can also um, uh, can also lead to weight regain in a dramatic fashion. Um, nutritional deficiencies, we're going to monitor those vitamin, vitamins more frequently. Fortunately, most patients who've had bariatric surgery are on prenatal vitamins as one of their supplements anyway, so their folate levels are hopefully high enough. And we see these patients more frequently than we would a typical bariatric patient. So in addition to the regular B follow-up, if someone's pregnant, they'll tend to see, uh, seeing me is not that important, seeing our dietitian and having your blood work drawn, that's very important. And they'll tend to be seen every month, uh, maybe six weeks, until we're reassured that they're gaining weight in appropriate amounts. So they should gain weight. They probably should not gain as much weight as someone who has a body mass index of 20. And we tend to recommend an increased daily protein intake, shooting for 100 to 120 grams per day versus the typical 60 to 80 or 90 grams we recommend uh, patients who have had prior uh, weight loss operations.
gastric band, uh, fortunately, this doesn't cause as debilitating problems as protein malnutrition, but it can create some issues in terms of weight gain. You're basically giving a pregnant person a mechanical proximal gastric outlet obstruction, and if they're struggling through hyperemesis, that can be really miserable. So particularly during the first trimester, we may need to access support, remove all the fluid. I don't necessarily do all of that. This is a time when these patients actually see me more frequently in addition to seeing the dietitian because we want to balance that, you know, enough weight gain to be healthy but not so much weight gain that that's going to be detrimental uh, to being able to lose it uh, after surgery. And so those patients will see me more frequently along with their obstetrician and our weight loss dietitian. Uh, they tend to get some adjustments during their pregnancy. Often when they find out they've become, they become pregnant, uh, we'll remove a portion of the fluid right away, particularly if they're dealing with the hyperemesis, and we'll follow them up. If their weight, if their weight gain is appropriate, uh, we'll keep them where they are. If their weight gain is too much, we actually may put some of that fluid back in to help uh, reduce the risk of, you know, of over amounts of weight gain. So in summary, uh, one more topic actually I didn't get a chance to get in my slides today, but the other one is uh, splenic artery aneurysms, which can be a, a lethal, life-threatening problem. Uh, fortunately, they're not common, but they're the most common visceral aneurysm that, that tends to present uh, in young women after pregnancy. There's hormonal change that lead to deterioration as the arterial splenic artery is an easy target for it. Um, and those patients will often present with a herald uh, epigastric abdominal pain that's severe and typically different from what they've experienced with pregnancy. And that pain usually results from a rupture of that aneurysm into the lesser sac. And so that's basically a contained uh, arterial bleed. Um, there's a time period in which you can work with patients up and evaluate them, but severe, horrible epigastric pain, uh, vomiting in a patient in a late stage of pregnancy where those symptoms are different from what they've had before should have some evaluation. Um, that can be done with an MRI. It can be done with the CT scan, a low contrast protocol, um, because that first set of symptoms is typically the only one you get. The next set of symptoms is cardiovascular collapse from free intraperitoneal rupture of, a, of, a, of an aneurysm, and that tends to be a lethal event. Um, so in general, you will encounter pregnant patients who need surgery. Uh, we try to manage them similar to non-pregnant patients if they're typical, if they're very, very symptomatic. If their symptoms are minimal, if, such as in the case of umbilical hernias, try and get them through the pregnancy and avoid surgeries during the during the pregnancy. Uh, fetal monitoring should be done where indicated in these special populations, particularly in trauma patients, patients who have had bariatric surgery. A high uh, index of suspicion is very helpful uh, for those. Uh, patient populations. So um, I think uh, we certainly have time for some to answer some questions uh, in panel discussions among uh, the participants. Uh, Steve, can you take a couple of us off a of mute and maybe try and get to some of the, some of these last few questions while we have a couple of minutes? I'm back. Sorry, going so going through a couple of these uh, follow-up protocol patients who's had who's pregnant had gastric bypass. Again, follow up with me is is okay. Follow up with a dietitian and having those vitamin levels checked, I think, is far more important than seeing a surgeon. But but as surgeons, we tend to be the gateway to that person. Um, and I agree, folate levels before conception. Hopefully, they're on their prenatal vitamins as part of a typical post-op uh, protocol, um, and so they're taking those uh, in advance. So. Other topics, any questions any of the participants have, want to send them in uh, for kind of a last minute, try and get some things home, uh, anything you want us to go over at all? 
There was some talk there, John, about location if your hospital doesn't have a OB services. I saw that being bantered about. Yeah, I think um, that hopefully, there. Ho hopefully that's um, that's uh, that's an infrequent problem. I, I think if it's a dire emergency and you know that if the if the mother is gonna gonna die without an urgent intervention, I think you're kind of stuck and you take care of them as you would any other patient. On the other hand, if it's acute cholecystitis. But probably even acute appendicitis, I really think you should get those patients in the in the hands of a, a center that has all those services available. In addition to that, probably having neonatology, if it's a patient who's uh, preterm, I, I would make sure you have that available to you. Um, other questions, Matt Goldblatt, kick out a gallbladder after delivery, when the patient can lift their baby, I'd say the day they're born. Um, I don't give a lot of weight lifting restrictions after gallbladder surgery, maybe a week or two. I don't know, Sabrina, uh, Siva, do you guys have other thoughts or comments about that? No, I agree with you. Uh, certainly, also, if you do it laparoscopically, you use the, um, the varus ports, which is just a splitting port, the risk of herniation is... Uh, probably pretty low. Uh, certainly, you use the Hassan to get in, um, but I would um, I would wait a couple of weeks at most, at most. No, and I would agree with you. Uh, I, I don't think uh, carrying a 10-pound baby is a, a big deal. So the other question that comes up frequently, maybe not during pregnancy, but right after pregnancy, and Dave, this may be a better question for you, is um, do patients have to, can they breastfeed the day uh, that they have general or sedation anesthesia? Do they have to pump and dump? Can they take their pain medicines? Can they take Norco and all this stuff without any risk to their baby? That's a very good question and sort of uh, depending on the mother and her thoughts, uh, Sentinel study on that was done at our institution by some of my colleagues. They look for uh, many of the common uh, anesthetic drugs, propofol, fentanyl, and midazolam, in breast milk of patients coming for elective surgery who were breastfeeding. And uh, we couldn't find any in the studies that we did in the levels we were able to look for them in. doesn't mean they're not there, just small levels. So the most conservative thought is 24 hours probably pump and dump. Um, if you don't have any you know, breast milk uh, saved up and your uh, child will only take breast milk and won't take formula, then it's probably safe to continue in, uh, breastfeeding as the current recommendations from us. What about pain medications, like some, say someone's taking Vicodin or Norco, is there any, is there any risk of that with breastfeeding? Um, in, in reasonable levels, narcotics can be taken. A, show up in breast milk and very small, if anything, but uh, uh, that's something probably consult the obstetricians or uh, with if there's, if, if they're post-delivery, um, there, there are many people on those medications and safely breastfeed. Sure. Great. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. If everyone's able to fill out the SAGES survey that's going to be sent to you very shortly, it'll take a couple of minutes. We're certainly open to suggestions and topics uh, for the future. I want to thank everyone for their attendance. certainly want to thank all the presenters, Siva, Dave, and Sabrina, for their expertise. I've, I've learned quite a bit today about uh, things I should be doing a little bit differently with pregnant patients. The next Sages Resident Webinar is going to be held on Tuesday, December 8th at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central. Uh, the topic, very timely for the holiday season and uh, January, it's going to be how to prepare for the ab site appropriately uh, with Dr. Michael Awad. Uh, In March 16th to the 19th. It's a fantastic meeting, especially as a resident. Uh, you have a chance to learn quite a bit, meet some great uh, faculty, and it's a wonderful experience. So thank you all for your participation and joining, with, joining us tonight. Thank you. Audio recording for this meeting has ended.